So as you remember, QI Power Hour uh, is a free monthly WebEx offering hosted by Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. QI Power Hour provides opportunity for colleagues across uh, healthcare sector and beyond to hear from local and national improvement experts on a variety of quality improvement related topics. We've designed these sessions to be short, accessible, and recorded to allow our colleagues who are not able to join us on the webinar today uh, to hear back in on the topics that we've covered. This is our 13th overall offering of QI Power Hour. Recordings from past presentations can be found on the Health Quality Council website under the QI Power Hour section. Uh, as we're using a teleconference line today in conjunction with our webinar, please note that we require all participants to mute their lines. Please do not use the mute function on your phone as this sometimes results in music playing on the line. Please press star six to mute your line and press star six again to unmute if you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A later this morning. I'll give everyone a moment now to make sure their lines are muted. Perfect, thanks. So to get the most out of today's session, we'd like to take a few short minutes to introduce you to a few of the functions we'll be using on today's webinar. These sessions are designed to be fun, interactive learning sessions, so we encourage your participation on today's webinar in a variety of ways. Please use the chat box function on the right-hand side of the screen during the presentation. We encourage you to use the chat function to share questions, comments, and ideas throughout the presentation. You can access the chat function by clicking on the message bubble on the top, the right-hand side of your screen. We will have some time dedicated to Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So please send your questions to all participants so that we can all join in the conversation. If you are experiencing technical difficulties this morning, please direct message the HQC host and they will be happy to help you resolve your issue. So to practice this function, uh, let's just take a moment uh, uh, to type in the name of your organization that you're joining us from today. So we'll just get you to go ahead and, and type in your organization in the chat box just to practice this function. Thanks, Travis. Travis joining us from RQHR. Heartland, Mama Wheaton, Cypress, Manitoba Health, SMA. Great, so you guys get the hang of it. So we'll look forward to using this, uh, this function uh, throughout the presentation. So the next tool that we want to introduce is the annotation function. Okay. <laughs> We were worried about this one because at our last offering of QI Power Hour, uh, it, did, um, it did not work for us. So we're going to avoid this function today uh, and maybe just move on. Uh, so we'll just rely on the chat function today. <clears throat> but we do want to invite you to uh, uh, tweet out during the presentation today. Um, so you can use uh, the hashtag QI Power Hour and the handle HQCSAS. We're just switching presenters here, uh, and I'll bring up the presentation. No, I got it. Yeah. Okay, so. You good? Two. Okay. Should be good. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Doug and Laura for today's session, Understanding Variation and its Importance to Quality Improvement. Welcome, Doug and Laura. Great, right, thanks, Chelsea. I'll just give it a moment to get loaded up again. Okay, so this uh, session today is the first in a series of two or three presentations that will explore variation. So today we're going to cover um, what variation is and what types of variation there are, and then future sessions we'll look at identifying variation and strategies that you can use to reduce variation. So, um, sorry, we just are having a little bit of technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, we're back. Doug will just get us to the right slide. Okay, so, yeah, so um, today we'll look at what variation is and what types of variations there are. So, the first thing, uh, I want to cover is what the objectives are for today. So the objectives are to learn the benefits of understanding variation as it relates to quality improvement and understanding the difference between common cause and special cause variation. 
So just so you know who the faces are behind the voices speaking today, we thought we'd quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Laura Schwartz, and I'm a researcher here at the Health Quality Council, working primarily in the appropriateness of care area. And my name is Doug Campbell. I also work at the Health Quality Council. I am a provincial improvement consultant, and I work mainly in health system planning and reporting. So where does this presentation fit with previous sessions? This um, presentation was designed to build on some of the previous presentations, including measurement and data, visual displays of data, and run charts, most recently given in July this year. And where does this presentation fit with the model for improvement? Uh, understanding variation is going to help you to um, identify whether or not a change that you've made is resulting in an improvement. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit deeper um, further on in the slides. So let's start with um, an interactive. So well, this is a uh, graph that I pulled from the NHS in Scotland looking at average length of stay by date of discharge. So we want to just get a bit of an understanding of um, what people know about data and variation. So using the poll function, let us know what you think of this graph. Yeah, if you saw that at one of your wall walks, what would you think? Would you be talking about how good you guys are doing, that this is kind of bad and it's something you want to work on, that we actually have no clue because there's not enough information? Or a fair answer as well would just be, I don't know, which is good, which means we have some stuff we can teach you. So it looks like we're getting most of the answers coming in with there's either not enough information or I don't know, both of which I think would be probably correct ways to look at this. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. We can tell there's a lot of variation, but without the proper context and some other signals, we don't know if it's actually good or bad. So, well done. Close the poll. And if you want to continue. Okay. Okay, so going on next, we'll look at what the benefits of understanding variation as it relates to quality improvement are. So starting really basic, um, what is the definition of variation? So Webster defines variation as the act or process of varying, or perhaps more related to what we're going to talk about today, a measure of the change in data or variable or function. <laughs> so where does variation exist? Well, the short answer is it exists absolutely everywhere, from our household expenses to our behavior, uh, from the time it takes to travel to Think about how long it took you to drive to work today. Probably it was a little bit different than it was yesterday or the day before that. It's always a little bit different depending on the weather or the traffic, uh, and this is true for every area of our life, including healthcare. Variation exists here just as it does in all other areas. So some examples of variation in healthcare include what we just chatted about, uh, length of stay for patients admitted to the hospital for the same diagnosis, variation in ED wait times from day to night shift, and variation in prescription for antibiotics for cough and cold symptoms. Some of this variation is warranted and is fine, but some of it is unfounded or unintended, and that's what we want to focus on today, that unintended or unfounded variation. W. Edwards Demings, who is a well-known management consultant, once said that uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. And there's many people who have shown that uncontrolled and unintended variation in healthcare can be very damaging to the quality of care that we provide our patients. And by uh, understanding and controlling it, we can improve the quality of care that's provided. To do this, data needs to be collected and variation needs to be tracked over time to understand if it's impacting care. We thought we would give you a real-life example of how variation in clinical care can impact quality. This is a study that was completed by, by Intermountain Healthcare, which for those of you who don't know Intermountain, it's a world-renowned group of hospitals and clinics in the United States who on a day-to-day -day basis use data to improve the variation in care uh, that's provided to their patients. So this study looked at the differences in radical prostatectomies performed by each surgeon on a really similar group of patients. Each line represents a surgeon, and the green boxes represent the me median surgical time uh, for each surgeon, and the red circles are the median grams of tissues that were removed. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation. Just take a look at um, Surgeon J. They spent a, 
almost the longest amount of time in surgery and removed the most amount of tissue. And compare it to surgeon F, who spent even longer in surgery but removed, I think, almost the least amount of tissue. Um, so let's just take a look at a couple further graphs to see how this variation impacted their quality of care. So the variation in the way the surgery was performed resulted in very different lengths of stay for these patients who are a really similar group of patients. They were grouped by staging of cancer, age, that sort of thing. And so we would expect um, their average length of stay to be pretty similar, but in this graph, it's quite a, a variation in differences. And this didn't just um, touch on the quality of care. It actually was, um, they also found a pretty distinct variation and the cost of the hospital each surgeon had based on their coaches. And by improving the variation in this area and in many others, international success in patient outcomes and increasing um, physician productivity. So I just want to jump back to the model for improvement so that we can understand how um, really learning about variation and understanding it properly can help us with our quality improvement journey and the model for improvement. So, First of all, just like we chatted about with Intermountain in this uh, radical prostatectomy example, understanding variation can show us where there might be a problem in the care that's being provided. It can also, understanding it can also tell us whether or not any change we've implemented has resulted in an improvement. Uh, Paul Batalden said variation speaks to the system that produced it. So, um, or, sorry, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So, um, if we want to improve variation, we need to improve the system. So I want to take a look at these two questions. Do the latest standardized test scores indicate that my child's school is improving? And do the two medication errors this month in our hospital indicate an, an undesirable trend? Take a minute to think about this or chat about it amongst the, your colleagues uh, with you today. And then using the chat function or uh, the teleconference line if you want, let us know whether or not there's any more information you need in order to um, answer these questions properly. So I'll just open it up for comments now. Just a reminder, if you'd like to share on the teleconference line, you'll need to press star six to unmute your line. So I think each of these are talking about Drawing a conclusion from one data point. Okay. And do you think by just having one data point, that's enough information for you to make a decision? Absolutely not. I think we would agree. We definitely would. So, question from the chat here uh, from Travis. Uh, what were my child's previous scores compared to, um, are we comparing it to themselves or are we comparing it to uh, the standard? Yeah, and that's definitely a question you'd want to ask, and I think that relates back to the need for collecting all of that data and showing it properly, which is going to lead well into what Laura's mm -hmm. going to talk about next. Yeah, so you need more than one data point to understand whether or not there's a variation. So this um, is something that was covered in a previous uh, Power Hour in July, but collecting data over time is really, really crucial for understanding variation, so I'm just going to quickly touch on it one more time. So if you collect data only at pre and post intervention times, you can have some pretty misleading results. Take a look at this bar chart below. Um, some change was made between week seven and week eight. So what they did was they measured before the change on week four and they measured after the change on week 11. And looking at this bar chart, there was a five hour decrease in delay time, which to me signals, wow, whatever change we made on week seven has resulted in a pretty significant change and we should really pat ourselves on the back for it. But let's look at this in another way. Let's say we collected data over time for 14 weeks. Looking at that top graph, what do you see? Uh, so instead of the data really showing a steady decrease when the um, change was made at week seven, we actually see a high level of variation over time. There's not really any trend, the data just varies. So it doesn't look like whatever change we made at week seven made any difference, it just looks like the time we, um, the data we pulled at week four had particularly high d delay times, and the data we pulled at week 11 had particularly low delay times. And just to really drive this point home, we'll look at one more chart. Um, so does it appear that the change between week seven and week eight resulted in a change to the delay time? It actually seems like um, the time started to decrease around week four, 
which doesn't, isn't related to any change we made at week seven. So this is just a couple of examples of why it's really, really important to collect data over time to understand whether or not any changes that you've made um, are resulting in improvement in the variation. So when we view variation in data, our first instincts are to make a change or improve that variation. But if you don't completely understand the variation, your actions can actually have a negative impact. So it's really critical that we understand the difference between common cause and special cause variation. And this is something that Doug is going to discuss next. Sure. So if I can kind of impress upon you anything during this power hour, it's that the most important concept that when you're trying to understand and look at variation and determine how to reduce it is to understand what type of variation it is that's actually occurring. So there's two types of variation that can occur. The first is common cause variation, and the second is special cause variation. So if you're not familiar with common cause variation, it's possible you've heard of it by another name such as unassignable variation or random variation or even appropriate variation. But that appropriate variation term isn't something that I like very much. Terming something appropriate requires a really good understanding of the entire situation and I'm not sure that you could get that just by looking at a graph. So what is common cause variation? Well, it can be thought of as the randomness that occurs in a process or a system. It's randomness that is predictable, though. So by that, I mean it's the randomness in the time it takes for me to make breakfast in the morning. It's usually going to take between 8 and 12 minutes, but depending on how many times I check Facebook or if I'm tired or what I'm making, it's going to vary day to day. I can bank on it being in that 8 to 12 minute range. So here's a run chart that's consistent and it's predictable. It looks like the value is always going to be in that sort of 160 to 170 range. So that's great, right? I mean, we've got it predictable, so that must mean it's good. Well, what if I told you this was someone's false blood pressure? Well, that's not great because they're supposed to be in that 90 to 120 range. So despite this actually being predictable, it's necessarily good. As I sort of mentioned, with everything, you need to be able to understand your process and the context to draw an accurate conclusion about the data. Just because it's stable doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Just predictable. But the good news is that a predictable process is a manageable process. You know what to expect so you can actually plan accordingly. So in the graph shown below, the 30-day readmission uh, rate is holding pretty steady around 10%. And this is real data from Saskatchewan. So in a perfect world, what we would have is beds available for those 10% of people that we expect to come back because we can bank on it. But, I mean, I guess in an actual perfect world, nobody would com be coming back because they'd be getting the perfect care. But that means a change in the system would need to occur. The other type of variation that can occur is special cause variation. It's also called assignable variation, non-random variation, or unfortunately it's called inappropriate variation sometimes. And again, I don't like the term inappropriate variation. This is because a big change in the data could be a good thing that is appropriate and should be something you'd want to try and repeat. So special cause variation is variation that's due to something out of the ordinary. It's not predictable and that causes an unstable process. Special cause variation would be if it took me 45 minutes to make breakfast in the morning instead of that 8 to 12 minutes. Something would have caused this process to change from the normal. So maybe I cut my finger or, who knows, the fire alarm went off and I had to leave the house. Being able to understand what caused that special cause is the key to this type of variation. And to do that, you need to do some digging in to understand what that root cause was. So, as mentioned, special cause variation, to fight despite the fact that it is unpredictable, doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. So for example, if the infection rate after surgery plummeted for a couple of weeks, then went back up to the value it was at before, you'd want to do some digging into the special cause that happened there because that's a good thing. You'd want to figure out what was happening in that process so that you could emulate it and repeat it and reduce those surgical infections. So here's an example of common cause and special cause variation. Does anyone on the call have any guesses as to what this might be? And there's a little bit of a hint. Those dates are very important, and that's going to be kind of your answer as to what, what this is. So if you've got thoughts, feel free to put it in the chat or shout it out, and we'll see if anybody gets close. Or those of you in the room, if you have any thoughts. All right, everyone's a little shy this morning, or the question's too hard, both of which are fair. 
Uh, decent guess, actually, from Jocelyn. Lean leaders approaching certification. Not bad. I can appreciate it, and it would probably be a pretty interesting graph, but that's not what this one is. This one is the number of mentions in the media per day of Donald Trump. So politics aside, it does make for a pretty interesting chart that shows common cause and special cause variation. So if you look at the start of the chart, there's common cause variation. It's predictable. There's going to be between 0 and 10 mentions per day. Then special cause happens because of a huge change in the data. He announces that he's running for president. The number of mentions becomes unpredictable and unstable and then becomes very unpredictable when he's actually elected. After, it sort of stabilizes again and becomes predictable, and that would be back to the common cause variation. But it's at a much higher rate than it was before because of a change in the system. So that's how variation can affect what's going on. Here's an, another example that we're all likely fairly familiar with, but maybe haven't thought of it in terms of the type of variation that's happening. So on the left is a normal sinus rhythm for a heartbeat. The pattern is predictable, and while they're not exactly the same each time, you pretty much know what's coming next. But on the right is a person with an atrial flutter. The variation isn't predictable, and digging into why would lead, to, lead us to conclusion of some kind of a cardiac <coughs> issue. Another example of variation is something as simple as writing the letter A. So those first 10 letters at the top were written with the right hand, and the second 10 letters were written with the left hand. So each series contains variation caused by just common cause. So every time I'm writing with my right hand, it's not going to be exact identical changes, but it's going to be pretty close and pretty predictable. Same thing with the left hand. They're all going to kind of look bad, I guess, because I'm right-handed, but it's going to be predictable what they might look like. But the difference between those two is the special cause that happened. It was a change in the system. I changed from using my right hand to my left hand. So being able to distinguish what the difference was between those two types of data is the key to understanding variation and using it for quality improvement. So here's another example that might resonate with some of the QI people that are on the phone. So for most of us, the first step in doing any QI activity is to understand what you're working to improve. And usually that involves creating a value stream map, which for those of you that may not be familiar with it, it's essentially the process steps that happen for something to occur the amount of times they take to happen and some ideas to make it better. So, for instance, if you look at this graph, what we usually do is say, what's value added and what's not? And then we try and improve the things that are not value added. But to, in order to determine what time is value added and what time is not, we usually do something called a time observation. And you'll do a lot of these. So you'll go out and you'll take five or ten observations of the same process and you'll get different numbers each time, and then you select the one you think is most reasonable, and you put that on your value stream map. What you're actually looking at there is variation for each one of those steps, because that time isn't the same. Little changes each time cause a change in that process. So that it's just another way of looking at variation, but it's not something we normally do. We're just looking at the time and picking one, instead of trying to dig into, well, why was that time higher? Why was that time lower? Why do we think this one in the middle is the appropriate one and the one we want to emulate? So it's one of those things that I think we could dig into a little more if we knew more about variation and how to do, manage it using quality improvement. So now again, hopefully you'll be a little less shy. It's time for a little bit of audience participation. Um, so what are some examples of common or special cause variation that you can think of either from your home life or from things you've seen at work? So a couple more examples that we've got around here are, as Laura mentioned, the driving time to work or sort of the time from when you wake up to the time you leave the house, the emergency department wait times rely a lot on variation, and for someone who has diabetes, their blood sugar levels are based on variation as well, and so is the management of that practice. So what else can you think of? Or do you have any examples of QI things that were difficult to tackle because there was so much variation involved in them? So on the chat, we've got Jocelyn from HQC. Thanks, Jocelyn. Large variation in the length of our huddles. Generally, they're common cause variation because we use standard work, so they're predictable, but occasionally something will happen to make it much longer or much shorter, so that would be special cause. So that's a great example. Anyone think of anything else? So 
Oh, there's a great one as well. Class duration at the U of S. That's totally fair. I mean, there's, this is a great example, too, of there's common cause variation on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Every class is supposed to be 50 minutes long. They might run 45 to 55 minutes, but it's pretty predictable that it should be around that 50-minute mark. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, if I remember correctly, the, hour, the classes were an hour and 20 minutes. So on those days, the common cause variation should be around that hour and 20 minute mark. But there's a special cause from Monday to Tuesday that changes that process. So you could look at that as, well, why is this so different? And that's the special cause that could trigger you to say, oh, it's because the class, class length is different. So that's a great, great example. Patrick Fallacy, thank you very much. Primary health care surveys. So when we look at the past couple of years, we see very little random variation. It's mostly, mostly common cause, and that's true. Um, we did a little bit of digging into that with the primary health care directors group. And for a lot of the questions, they were essentially stable. You knew what was going to come in every single month. So it was a question we started to have with that group of, it's not improving, it's not getting worse, it's very stable at a good number. What do you want to do with this? Do you want to continue asking the question, or do you want to take on some pieces of work to try and make this even better? So thanks, everyone. Those are some good examples. Another example that was given, sick time utilization. I think that would be a very interesting one to dig in. I'm sure there would be things that look like special cause around weekends and holidays, those sick days happening to make four-day weekends. There would be all kinds of fun things you could dig into that, trying to try and understand the week. So, yeah, we've got some great examples, so thank you very much. And for those of you interested, they're all coming through the chat. If you want to see them, then think through how you might classify them as common cause or special cause. So to wrap up, and we wanted to kind of keep this presentation to that half hour mark again, just to try and keep everyone's attention focused for that shorter amount of time than the hour. So just in quick wrap, wrap up here, I want to touch on why this is so important. So variation is such a threat to best practice and improve patient care that there's entire quality improvement programs and organizational philosophies built around reducing it. So as Laura mentioned, Intermountain Healthcare, which is looked at as a world leader for quality improvement, bases their efforts on finding variation wherever it occurs and understanding it, and then if they think they need to address it, they develop a team and try to reduce it. The Clinical Quality Improvement Program, which launched in January in Saskatchewan, is based in foundations of reducing variation and optimizing care. And then last but not least, of course, the Appropriateness of Care Framework, which was modeled after Intermountain's values, is a provincial initiative for reducing variation. And that's about giving the right care to the right patient at the right time in the right place. So it's about doing what's best for the patient and making their care the best possible. Being able to understand this concept and then use the lean tools that we've learned to address it, quality of care in this province and elsewhere for those of you that are calling in from afar. So what's next? So today was really meant just to give you an overview of the importance of variation and the types of variation that can occur. But you're probably thinking, well, that's nice, but what can I do about it? And that's where our next QI Power Hour will go in June. So there are specific tools you can use to tell what type of variation occurs within a process. And there was a question put on the chat earlier about, well, I'd like to know what actually constitutes a gain in my child's academic proficiency, something along those lines. And those tools are something we'd be able to use to look at whatever their scores were and whatever the schools were, scores were to tell if there was actually a change or if it's just random variation of going up and down. So, something that can be used in healthcare, but it can also be applied to all kinds of different situations. So once you understand what type of variation is occurring, there are specific management strategies for each type of those variations. Because if you choose the wrong type of management strategy, you can actually make that variation worse. So for example, if there was common cause variation, would we want to go out and do an RPIW or a, a rapid process improvement workshop, for those of you not familiar with the term? Or if you saw a special cause variation, what would your first step be? of the topics we're going to cover in our next QI Power Hour, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, if you want to go back and look at the data that you're looking at at your huddles and see if you see common cause or special cause variation, think through if huddle to huddle you're saying, oh, we did a great job yesterday because we had less of a wait time, but ah, oh, we did bad yesterday because the wait time went up a little bit. See if you're managing your processes that way and think about how you could look at that differently to say, well, this is just what our process is and we should expect fluctuation, or was this really a big change? So that's all that we have for today. Um, we've still got 30 minutes if there's discussion that people would like to have or any thoughts or questions they have.
uh, we'd be happy to answer them. And if not, then we've definitely got some found time. So feel free to ask away. And I'm going to just pass the host back to Chelsea so that she can load up a poll. So you may see the slides disappear. So any thoughts or questions? So maybe it would be, uh, sorry, it's Patrick here. Maybe it'd be helpful if, um, you know, what would be some of the things you would, you know, in the absence of, you know, control charts and so on, what would be some things we could look for to maybe spot when something's a little off, off track? Spotting the variation, I think, even day to day might be helpful. Sure. Well, there are some, if you think back to the presentation that Adrian Danilou and Anna Luke gave in July, I think it was, on run charts and the rules we use, those are some of the basic tools you can use to identify when there's been a change in the process. And those are things like if there's been a shift in data. So if there's six points in a row above or below the median, that would signify a shift. Or if there's a, a trend or a run, if you saw five or six points in a row moving either in an upwards direction or a downwards direction. That would signify that something's changed in the process. If you see an astronomical point, something that's just out to lunch, something so different that it just doesn't make sense, that would be a signal that something different has happened. So if you want to dig a little more into that, I would say go back and review that presentation on run charts and the rules for using them. And that would be a, a quick signal on how to look at your data over time and know if something's different. So we do have a, a question on the chat. It's how important is it to understand slash test special cause variation in a PDFA cycle? Is it in the scope? So that, I was going to say that will get well into the management strategies that we'll cover in the next topic. But I would say that if you're looking at special cause, PDSA might not exactly be how you want to address that. It would be one of the ways. But you want to first dig into root cause and do a little bit of sort of PQA or analysis of the problem to understand it. PDSA is usually meant for when you're in the common cause, so if it's predictable, then you want to make small changes to your system to try and improve it without throwing things out of, out of whack, and that's where the PDSA cycle comes in. So if you think back to Doug's example of the common cause variation and the high blood pressure for that one patient, the doctor would hopefully implement a PDSA cycle. They would try a change to see whether or not it brought the blood pressure down. They'd look at it, and then if it didn't bring the blood pressure down, they would try something else. So I think that's maybe where it would fit. Um, and um, that is something that we'll dig into more in June. Yeah. And I mean, really, the PDSAs are small scale tests of change. If you saw a special cause that was either really good or really bad that threw your system way out of whack, you would probably need something more than small scale to bring it back to a either to change it to where you want it to be or to bring it back to something that's acceptable. You need to actually totally change the process as opposed to just tinkering with small bits of it. So good question. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? I think there is a poll open if you'd like to give some feedback on our presentation today. Uh, it back up. So it's basically on what you thought of it, if there's things that would have made it better, and then what we could do for future improvements on the QI Power Hour. So we would appreciate your feedback on that, obviously. It helps us try and get better each time we do this. So we do have another question in the chat. Is there a standard number of measurements that needs to be taken before one can confidently assess variation? Yeah, and there is absolutely some science and some statistics behind that. Um, a good rule of thumb is I usually like to start with at least 12 data points before I start trying to draw too many conclusions. I think the number that's commonly sort of accepted as you could see the variation is 20 data points, and then more than that is even better. But 12 will give you an idea. 20 would be fairly mathematically acceptable. But I mean, really start with one or two and just start collecting data points, and your information will grow as you collect more. So I wouldn't judge a lot of stuff by those first couple points, but once you start putting things over time, you'll start to understand the process. So that'd be my take on it. I don't know if anyone has any different thoughts. I'd be happy to hear those. 
just a consideration that it might take um, quite a, a different span of time to collect that, those 20 data points. So if a process is reoccurring multiple times in a day, you could collect all of those data points within a 24-hour period or even less, perhaps. But if, um, if the process that you're looking into occurs, you know, once a week or once a month, uh, you're looking at a much longer lag time to be able to compare those data points. Right. So I guess if you're, if you're collecting data multiple times a day, you might need more data to assess the variation to understand how it's changing over time. Yeah. Right. So are we seeing trends um, within a 24-hour period? Are we seeing different trends um, from weekday to weekend, from days to night? Things like that. Okay. Thanks for that question. Some, some shifts that we might see might even be seasonal. So emergency department waste, for example, um, you might want to dig into the data to see uh, how, how those trends and how that variation looks from the spring, for example, to flu season. Uh, so those, there might be seasonal factors that affect your variation as well. And yeah, I mean, the gist of what Chelsea's saying is the more data you have, the better. And so, I mean, if you have years and years of data, you'd be able to see those seasonal trends. And then you'd be able to look at it from winter to winter. Was this a higher than expected, lower than expected, or is it kind of where we thought it would be? So that's probably, I don't exactly know how some of those um, forecasting things work for Saskatoon Health Region and Regina, but my assumption is they work along those principles of we can predict based on what happened in the past, but then we need to compare it to see how good our model is. So thank you everyone for your participation today. Uh, thanks for your involvement uh, in the chat. We apologize for the technical issues early on. Uh, we'll get those sorted out for the next power hour. Uh, just as a reminder, this session has been recorded. Um, so if there's anything you want to go back to, um, the, the information will be posted to our website uh, by early next week. Um, if you would like to reach out to Doug or Laura, feel free to, uh, to do so. Their contact information is listed on our website as well. Uh, and with that, we'll wish you a, a happy Friday and uh, a, good, a good weekend. Thanks, everyone.